worldwide Bitcoin accumulation country. We've got a very special week. We're going to be dropping. This is the second episode that we're dropping this week. This is season three, episode 26. And what we did in this case was we got together with um, Crypto Creamers and Bitcoin Kindergarten, which is Optimist Fields and Nick Can't Mine. And from Crypto Creamers, we had Nico. All of us got together and did a collab chat with with Corey Clipston from Swan Bitcoin. So normally I do a little pitch, you know, at the beginning of the podcast talking about Swan and dollar cost averaging. But I figured since, you know, this is a whole entire episode, you know, pretty much just talking to Corey and asking him questions about Swan. So I, I figured, you know what, you guys are going to hear enough of it anyways. But it's a really cool chat uh, between all of us. And Corey is just a really well-spoken guy who's got some great vision and really glad to uh, to share this with uh, the Bitcoin community. So without further ado, here is our collab with... Corey Clipston from Swan Bitcoin. What's up, guys? Today's our first collab between uh, between Fun with Bitcoin, BTC Kindergarten, and the Crypto Creamers. And today we are featuring the CEO of SwanBitcoin.com. What's up, everybody? Yo. What up? Hey, Nico and friends. What's, What's happening? <laughs> All right. So I'm going to start it off with the first question. Corey. How did yes, you sir. come up with Swan Bitcoin? And I'm going to add a follow-up. Did you buy the right. domain first or did you come up with the name first? Uh, well, how did we come up with Swan? I'll start with that one. Um, basically, so I, I think you guys probably know we started a product called Give Bitcoin last year, which launched, launched last November just before Christmas. And, uh, you know, hundreds of Bitcoiners used it to try to red pill friends and relatives and bosses were using it on their employees and stuff. And that was, uh, you know, a nice product. Uh, what was interesting is within that, we always thought probably the best way to, uh, actually make money was to take the givers and the receivers on give Bitcoin and just let them buy Bitcoin for themselves because people are more likely to spend a lot of money over time buying Bitcoin for themselves than, for, than for somebody else. Mm -hmm. Um, and we saw that start to happen and we started to see it happening quite a lot. And we also saw people actually using it to give gifts to themselves because, because we actually had a recurring gift feature. So when people started giving gifts to themselves on a recurring basis, we were like, that probably needs to be its own product. We should strip that out and, and really make it its own thing. Um, so the very poorly named working title for that product was Save Bitcoin. So there was a little bit of noise in December uh, around save Bitcoin. And we very quickly realized that was not the best brand of all time. And uh, I was actually just driving on PCH uh, Pacific Coast Highway out here in LA and I was thinking about it and uh, the name just kind of popped in to my head and I couldn't get it out of my head. And um, it was just, uh, it was great on a lot of different levels for us. We, uh, we really like having the association with uh, a black swan because black swans can be positive or negative. And so I see, you know, Bitcoin as being a, a very huge black swan uh, on the order of something that we've probably never seen in our lifetimes before. Um, and I'm a huge Nassim Taleb fan, uh, have been for 18 years. So I thought that was like cool to have that association. Uh, we also like the uh, kind of association of, um, you know, a swan starting out as like an ugly duckling and, and becoming beautiful over time. And Bitcoin was just this thing that lived on the internet with a few cypherpunks and, you know, and we're still so early, but, you know, 11 years on, it's this massively important uh, shining beacon of hope and light for so many of us. Um, and so many people dedicate their lives toward, you know, this, this thing and this industry and the ideals around it. And, uh, you know, so it's very much on its way toward becoming a beautiful swan. So kind of the, the two of those seem to fit really nice. And then just from like a marketing and branding standpoint, if you have, um, if you have a brand that can lend itself to, you know, uh, a mascot or, or like a character that can be used and that you can play with in different ways. And you guys have seen us use different versions of the swan, like a goofy animal swan, but also, you know, kind of like a Batman superhero kind of super swan vibe. And we'll just keep on playing with that over time and, and letting the swan sort of be embodied. 
Um, and yes, as soon as I come up with uh, any sort of brand name, I usually do a domain search immediately and lock down anything remotely related to it. And so, yeah, we bought that kind of same day. Awesome. Yeah. I asked cause I kind of had, you know, I, I kind of had that similar experience where, you know, I came up with a cool name in my head and mm-hmm. then I'm like, okay, but wait, is the domain available? You know, and I, I kind of had to go through that whole ordeal myself. So, um, man, so you kind of answered my second question um, a little bit, which is, you know, because it's so unique what you guys do. So basically, you kind of answered that already, you know, by saying that you guys focus more on the reoccurring purchases, right? Because my my second question was, how do what do you guys do that's different than other exchanges? And why did you feel that you had this opportunity? Like, what niche did you have to fill, so to speak? Yeah, I, I think it's just kind of tapping into uh, consumer psychology a little bit and just understanding, you know, especially here in the United States, we're not very good savers. 99% of people, you know, really the only way that we're good at accumulating value in an asset is if it's a one-time decision and then it's just, it just happens automatically after that. So electing to have some of your paycheck, you know, turned into purchases of stocks or bonds or whatever through a 401k is something that millions of people do. And it's a, it's a good way for them to build value in an asset, obviously questionable value of some Mm -hmm. of the assets in 401ks these days, but uh, that has been a good way. And then another, another good example, really the only other good example is, uh, you know, deciding to buy a house and signing up for a mortgage and sort of being forced to make that payment every month. It's a one-time decision that you follow through on. And it's why, you know, the house is the one major source of wealth for the vast swath of people in this country that have any wealth. And so we thought that um, letting people make a one-time decision and commitment to start accumulating Bitcoin at a level they were comfortable with, and then just having that happen automatically uh, would be the best way for people to build uh, meaningful positions in, in Bitcoin as, as a part of their plan to, uh, to be wealthy, hopefully. Awesome. So, so just to, you know, just to tell our audience, once again, you guys found, you know, an opportunity with, instead of, you know, instead of how mo- most exchanges doing it, which is basically like, Hey, you could buy Bitcoin here. You kind of tapped into the U S consumer and you're like, okay, you know, if, if we, if we take that, you know, if we take that type of thought that he already has, and we kind of just add Bitcoin to the mix, you know, um, that kind of makes more that, that, you know, we have a, we have a need here. And then you guys already did your R and D with that first product that you did. Right. And then you found success in that and you're like, okay, I think I have something. And that evolved into Swan. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, so that's, that's all right. And then I also should, you know, of course mention that we had, um, you know, Pierre Richard banging the war drum starting in probably spring of 2019 talking about Bitcoin as a savings technology um, so that was kind of laying the groundwork and we could see that there were a lot of people enthusiastic about that. Um, you had Friar Haas, uh, Haas McCook, Haas McCook down in uh, Australia, talking a lot about uh, DCA and trying to push that dollar cost average. Um, and then obviously you could see uh, Alex Svetsky having some success uh, with Amber, which was doing a very similar version of what we do, just some differences in the mechanics, obviously in branding and stuff like that. Um, and then actually after we launched or after we started, I should say, I became aware of bitter, which, uh, rest in peace was kind of the, uh, the, an early version of Swan over in the EU. Um, what's unique about one of the things that's unique about being able to do it in the U S is, um, you know, we really think the user problem isn't quite solved unless all every aspect of it essentially is automated. So we have an automatic pull from the bank account, automatic purchase of Bitcoin, and then you can elect to have an automatic withdrawal to your uh, self-custody. And most other places around the world, you can't do the automatic pull from the bank with ACH. So instead it has to be sort of a a push from the customer, uh, you know, out of their bank account to the Bitcoin purchasing service. So uh, it is really nice how the product can operate on the banking rails here in the U.S. So I, I, I want to move on to a question from the other group, but man, that's, that's so cool. I'm, I'm really happy that you guys found that niche and um, it, you know, it's, it, I'm a big fan. I, I use it myself. You know, I kind of experiment with a lot of 
um, a lot of, I would say on ramp specifically, not so much an exchange. Um, but I kind of experiment and I, and you're so right. It's, it's about that. I would say, um, it's about like that frictionless experience, right. To have as much less friction as possible. I find myself using the cash app and Swan Bitcoin versus an exchange that I would pay much less in fees, but my experience is not going to be as, as you know, it's not, as, it's not as seamless. Right. And you know, if you do that week by week, I feel like it's just human nature to go with the, the less, the more seamless experience, so to speak. So, um, and yeah, and I know that, I know that Optimus had a question, so I'm going to move on to him. Yeah. What's up, Corey? Uh, fan of Swan, Swan user myself. Nice. Finally, finally got it rolling. Um, there we go. We're at a, so me and Nate host BTC kindergarten and um, we just, we do it for, you know, the noobs. We, we go out there and we just try to answer their questions as best as they can. And so my question for you is what is your elevator pitch for the noobs out there when you encounter them in real life? Just to, just broadly for Bitcoin or for yeah, Swan? Yeah, yeah, for Bitcoin so that they can get into Swan. Man, you know, I, I don't I don't run into a lot of people on the street these days, uh, you know, Bitcoin pitch in hand um, <laughs> in, this, in this time of quarantine. Um, you know, I think it really depends on who I'm talking to and where they come from. And I think that's something a lot of people have said. So, you know, I, I do think if you're going to try to, if you didn't know anything about the person, I think you know, better gold, digital gold, gold 2.0 um, seems to be the one that catches the most people. And I think that's why you kind of see it as the dominant meme. I happen to run in, uh, you know, outside of Bitcoin, very sort of tech heavy, um, kind of VC heavy circles from just kind of where I've spent my career um, prior. And so I often will get a little bit nerdy and do like not a, uh, not a headline first pitch. And I'll often just talk about, you know, essentially being able to, uh, I mean, honestly, well, <laughs> within a minute, I'm probably mentioning like Byzantine generals <laughs> <laughs> and talking about, you know, this, this computer science problem that was identified 40 years ago and how people were trying to solve it for 30 years. And it finally got solved in 2008 and then for the first time allowed you to send something over the internet and, and guarantee for sure 100% that uh, a copy was not retained by the sender. Um, and that kind of explodes people's minds who are used to dealing with software and internet and technology, and they can very quickly make the connection to, oh, if you can do that, then you can actually send value over the internet. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then one more, one more quick question on uh, your Swan, uh, some of your marketing. Have you guys, or are you guys well on your way on getting the million Bitcoiners stacking? Uh, boy, we're nowhere close to a million people. <laughs> um, but the trajectory is awesome. I mean, we've been in market. You know, I think we we launched to the public on March thirtieth. Um, it very much is uh, out of the gate like a freaking racehorse. It's been really fun to see. Um, I love to see it spread. We love to see people talking about it, recommending it, you know, jumping into arguments on different social media networks where we are not active. So we'll just, somebody will alert us to a thread on Reddit and there's, you know, 40 comments and there's a bunch of people arguing for Swan or saying this or that or the other. And, you know, one of the benefits of having a very simple product with simple talking points is lots of people can be on your side and make your arguments for you. So that's really what we try to do with our marketing is make it so that it's really easy for lots of people to talk about us and, and push it forward. Yeah. I think you guys have like really, really great marketing and uh, it just reminds me of the field of dreams quote. If you build it, they will come. So I think soon we'll be, soon we'll be getting there. Well, you know, the goal is 10 million, not just a million. So, Oh, you know. oh there we go. Yeah. So we, we've got a ways to go. Swans are very ambitious. All right, Nick. Before I say that, ask this, I think one of my favorite things about Swan is just seeing y'all dunk on Coinbase all day on Twitter. 
fuck Coinbase. I love that shit. But um, how do you like? Where do you guys get the Bitcoin to then sell to people? Uh, so this is an interesting thing about us. We are not a broker. Uh, so we are actually just a website that passes the user's instructions onto a payment processor, a liquidity provider, and a custodian. Um, so everything's hooked up by API, and we essentially have a banking partner in the back end that can pull the funds from the customer's account. It all just magically via API and, and code on the back end goes and places an order with no TC desk or an exchange, buys the Bitcoin, deposits it in the user's account. So that's how it works. Is that how like a lot of other companies work too? Like I, I have no idea how like Cash App and Coinbase get their, you know, Bitcoin. Yeah. Well. So interestingly, I, I just found out recently by listening, I was doing some oppo research and listened to an atrocious book called Crypto Kings, which is basically the story of Coinbase. And it's awfully reported and even worse read when you're used to listening to uh, the crypto economy or Bitcoin Audible, and then you hear somebody else attempt to read <laughs> brand names and people's names about crypto and Bitcoin. Uh, it's just really embarrassing. The guy called him Satoshi for six hours, polluting my ears. <laughs> Um, anyway, in that book, I learned that Coinbase actually used to be on both sides of the trade. So they had their like stack of Bitcoin and their stack of cash and they were running like a black box algorithm uh, and trying to uh, essentially like maximize their profit on, on every trade. Um, when they hired that COO who later got fired or left or whatever, he came in and was really scared at the, uh, <laughs> at the, the JV level of their algorithm and how it had such blow up risk. And so then they started only clearing trades when they had a match. So they, they basically don't take on that um, proprietary risk and they only match trades now. And it's been that way for a few years now at Coinbase since 2018 or something. Um, maybe earlier, maybe 2017. I don't know for sure how Square Cash App does it, but uh, I've definitely seen chatter that they're, probably selling their own Bitcoin and procuring like large chunks of it and managing out the price risk or whatever, which might make sense when you see uh, a lot of high volume days that they kind of appear to run out of Bitcoin or can't, can't clear purchases. So maybe, it, maybe they are selling their own and, you know, replenishing it, you know, according to demand going to OTC desks and trying to replenish their supply or something like that. But again, I don't, I don't have special knowledge of how they're doing it there. Um, you know, I think, I think uh, a lot of times exchanges also have an OCT, OTC desk, which is why they can go out into market. If they're running out of Bitcoin, they can go procure more. If they have too much Bitcoin, they can sell it off. Uh, I think uh, Gemini is a good example of that. I believe they have an OTC desk um, on top of being an exchange. And yeah, it's not uncommon. In our case, you know, we're not actually an exchange, as you noted, like we don't have sales. <laughs> fairly important to be able to sell Bitcoin if you actually want to be an exchange or literally just a way to buy Bitcoin. True. Um, okay, thank you for clearing that up for me. Um, another question I have is, can you like um, give us like your vision for Swan like out into the future like do you plan on implementing lightning or anything else or do you plan on like adding new things to swan like if that makes sense yeah yeah, yeah. we can talk a little bit about it and uh we've been pretty pretty vocal about our roadmap and what we think might be doable here you know i think one of the um we just want to be able to get as many people buying bitcoin you know buying as much bitcoin as possible that's kind of the the north star um so let's see the first thing that is interesting that's coming live pretty soon is one-time buys so right now you can only do recurring purchase we're going to add one-time buys um one-time buys will only be available to people who are already buying with swan on a recurring plan so you won't be able to just come on and not have a plan and make a one-time purchase so it's more just something that a lot of our users have asked for they want to do uh you know top ups or uh, or smash buy here and there and, uh, and and buy more than what they've planned for the week. 
Um, we're also going to be launching daily buys so you can sign up for a daily purchase instead of a weekly purchase. Um, we certainly see people, you know, seems like the math supports wanting to capture the whole curve and, and capture any little dips that might occur. And so over 80% of our users choose the weekly plan and, you know, less than 20% total have chosen paycheck or monthly plans. So we think there's going to be a pretty big demand for the daily plan as well. Um, so excited to roll that out. And then beyond that, a lot of it is like, how can you get this to more people? So, you know, we've got the, uh, the affiliate program, Swan Force, swanbitcoin.com slash enlist, if you haven't seen it. And that's how you can get awesome custom URLs like swanbitcoin.com slash coin Icarus and uh, see, a, see him sort of welcome you there. And, and that's, uh, that's a big deal for us. And we have a lot of people that are pretty well known in the space, like podcasters and authors and Max Kaiser and Preston Pish and people like that, that can shill their ref links here and there. Um, so that's pretty interesting. We, uh, we'd like to do a Swan IRA later this year. Um, we can do a custodial one pretty quickly. Um, and then uh, we're also looking at uh, kind of what's the best way to set it up and sort of package and market one that would be um, like a checkbook LLC and let people uh, uh, have self custody essentially and, uh, and still be able to keep that in a structure that is uh, tax advantaged in an IRA. Um, and then I think down the road, you know, Jan Pritzker, who's my co-founder and our CTO, has a long history of working with, uh, with APIs and exposing APIs um, for different services that he's run. This is his seventh startup and he's had three exits, so he's pretty damn good at it. Um, so we think there's a good opportunity to make it really easy to have like a, a buy with Swan or a buy Bitcoin button inside of lots of apps and financial products and websites and you know, hard wallets and different Bitcoin related services um, to be able to ena enable buys all over the place. Um, so that may be something that we get into uh, later this year or next year as well. Um, and you mentioned Lightning. Uh, you know, our because we can't touch the funds, we are limited in what we can do for the Swan product uh, based on what our custodian Prime Trust sort of has. So, for example, you know, right now. Uh, all we have for withdrawals are fixed addresses. So the best we could do is say, hey, you can upload and use as many unlimited number of fixed addresses for your withdrawals and rotate them through. Um, we will be turning on XPUB there soon for the withdrawals, but uh, you know they don't support uh, native SegWit BEC32 addresses yet. You know We'll be right there turned on as soon as they do and we push them and press them and, and try to get them to do it. Um, I think it'll be a while before you see like lightning distributions from prime trust um, and, you know, things like NIM, pay NIMS or something like that on the, uh, on the referral side, because that's just us saying thank you for making a referral and being able to pay somebody out. Um, that's where we can push the envelope and do cool things and, and use, uh, you know, lightning and pay NIMS and stuff like that. And our, our tech team is, you know, super nerdy Bitcoiners that absolutely love all that shit. And so we will definitely be doing, uh, pushing the envelope and doing whatever we can to, uh, to do cool things with, with second layer tech. That's awesome. That's, That's good to see. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm excited for the, the daily buys. I need to get on that Friar Haas McCook daily buy level. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, that, that, uh, that exchange down there in, uh, in Oz, Bitteroo, uh, I think lets you schedule it like every two hours. Wow. Um, That's crazy. Yeah. So Optimism. I mean, what, we were talking about that the other day. We're like the dope, the ultimate dopamine rush is just buying Bitcoin every hour. And then you're like, I found someone who was buying it every minute or something like that. And the lightning network is funny. It, yeah. I mean, you can have a constant stream essentially going right. Uh, it, the doling out of your, you know, your fiat, your digital fiat into Bitcoin, there's no real limit on, there's no real downward limit. You can do it every second. Um, but the ACH poll is still gonna always be kind of weekly. You don't wanna be hitting people's bank accounts like every single day. I think once yeah. a week is probably good for that. Awesome, awesome. Uh, Gordon Icarus, you have a question, bro? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, I actually, the, the one question that I had was, um, 
when can we expect to see a uh, an Apple or uh, Android app? Because that, to me, like the, it, it's not just. I, I mean, I totally love obviously the experience, you know, that uh, that you guys provide with Swan. But for me, like that's the that's the piece from from Cash App that I end up using. Where I'd like to use Swan that way as soon as possible. Yeah, we think we'll see a lot more demand for that, um, and it'll just become obvious that we need to get it done uh, after we turn on uh, one-time buys, because that's when you really want to be, you know, notifying people, you know, hey, here, here's the price, and it's five percent lower than yesterday. Do you want to do a top-up, stuff like that? So I think it'll just be kind of natural. Um, we already have uh, a fairly large name uh, in the Bitcoin space teed up and kind of. Uh, in our team Slack and learning about how we do things. Who's a, a rock star, not, not rock star developer, <laughs> the guy uh, who works on BTC Pay server and strike, but uh, a different developer who's a rock star and has a lot of experience building apps. Um, plus, you know, our team obviously has a lot of experience with it as well. So I think we'll probably break ground on the apps um, in August or September and have them out this fall. In the meantime, you know, I use, I actually use the mobile website as an app and I just, you know, I just, I put a shortcut to uh, app.swanbitcoin.com on my phone home screen and it works just fine. Yep. It's already designed for mobile and it's super fast and snappy. And I think for what we do today, that's, you know, sufficient. I've been doing that. <laughs> so. Good. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, so I have another question for you, Corey. Listen, so it was kind of a big deal when it happened on Twitter. And I, and I obviously want to get your perspective because you obviously you come from a tech background and you kind of know the ins and outs of what's happening. And I know that you live in California. So I want to get your perspective on PayPal, you know, coming to the scene. Obviously, you know, it, it's exciting news, but I, personally, I'm very hesitant, right? Because PayPal is just an awful service and it's just the, like the arch and I see PayPal is like the complete opposite of what Bitcoin represents. So I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Well, let me flip that back to you for a second. Let me ask you, why do you think it's the complete opposite of what Bitcoin represents? Because I'm worried that they'll set up like a type of paper Bitcoin, like similar to like how, how Robinhood works, right? Yeah. Where you could buy Bitcoin on Robinhood, but you can't withdraw it, right? So Cash App obviously took a different approach where you could withdraw the Bitcoin. But, you know, if I was over there at PayPal, I'd be kind of scared, you know, which is, which is the reason that I feel like Cash App took that opportunity right? Because mm -hmm. PayPal was hesitant, hesitant to even get involved with that. But now they don't have a choice, right? When, yeah. when Cash App announced they were making like 345 million uh, in quarter one of this year, right? I think PayPal was pushed into a corner. They're forced to basically release this to uh, PayPal and Venmo. So I'm kind of I'm kind of sketched out where they create this experience because I think you hit the nail on the head when you're talking about uh, consumer psychology, right? Yeah. And if they create this experience for the user where it gives the user no reason to withdraw from their ecosystem, right? Because PayPal is so huge already where they could just send the Bitcoin directly to someone else in the PayPal ecosystem. I don't think that's good for Bitcoin. I think that in the long term, Bitcoin will even it out. But I think in the short term, I'm kind of, I'm, kind of, I'm not as happy as everyone was. Yeah, so I mean, I've, I've seen that sentiment uh, widely spread. I think it's probably our job to highlight that as a negative and make them suffer uh, significant <laughs> collateral damage all over the internet if they don't allow Bitcoin withdrawals. You know, and just I think it's just an army of Bitcoiners recommending other services over that and slagging on people for not actually using Bitcoin and, you know, just being very uh, vocal and aggressive about it. And I don't care who you promote, can be us, can be Square, whatever. But, you know, freaking send Armstrong some business, at least Coinbase lets you withdraw your Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, so that that last reference kind of, you know. Yeah. But 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 I will say it's wildly bullish for that news to come out, even though like jump the gun and they're not, you know, anywhere close to what was talked about in the rumors or whatever. It is happening. Um, they have been working on it for nine months or so. Um, they will probably try to put something out later this year or the end of the year or whatever it is. 
Um, you know, I often say, I think there will be thousands to millions of Bitcoin sellers 10 years from now. Um, and it's just, uh, it's just greenfield for, for the time being. The good thing is, you know, the, the market will be <laughs> hundreds to thousands of times bigger in 10 years as well. Of course, of course. Um, man, well, thank you so much for that response. Very insightful. And um, I kind of segues a little bit into my next question. Um, and this is something that Swan Bitcoin doesn't do. Uh, so um, Coinbase in, in times of extreme, I would say, I wouldn't even say extreme. I would say in times of volatility, their service just happens to go offline. Um, I call BS there. Uh, I wanted to get your thoughts. Uh, so what BS in as much as you think that they're doing I think they have a switch to... in their algorithm, which basically says like, if it's, you know, if it's the volatility is more than 20%, they just cut mm -hmm. it, you know, kind of like the kill switch on the, you know, on the traditional finance markets. But who would benefit if they did that? Man, I mean, you kind of like the reason I asked this question is because like in the beginning, you know, you were talking about what you're reading in the book and it was basically saying that like, you know, like they were before they were kind of doing a thing where they're like try, like, trying to benefit on both sides of the trade, but that could mm -hmm. go horribly wrong if it's, it's, if it's one sided. Right. So I was thinking, yeah. I was like, you know, that kind of answers the question a little bit. Well, it's been years since they've done it that way. They've only been a matching engine for years now. Um, and sort of by definition, like if they, if it's volatile, the trading volumes are generally up. And so they make more money if it's volatile because the trading volume generally goes way up when there's volatility. So, you know, financially it would be in their benefit. They're not taking a bet, you know, long or short. So they, they love high volumes and would love to stay on. I think, uh, you know, their systems are notoriously poorly built versus what you would see from, you know, ICE or NASDAQ or something like that. Like it wasn't, it was software kids in San Francisco trying to build real financial infrastructure. And they just, you know, they built on sort of lightweight services that startups from Y Combinator generally use um, that no one on the East Coast would ever use to build a financial trading engine. So I think they've been playing catch up and, you know, volumes keep going up and and staying a little bit ahead of their tech roadmap and they haven't been able to quite catch up which we've seen even this spring, you know, these, these volume, big volume days have crashed them, but, but I don't think there's anything uh bit mexy going on there. Okay. Cool. Um, awesome. I think you can tell that I do think there's something shady going on with, uh, with <laughs> some of these offshore leverage exchanges like <laughs> FTX. The shit coin casinos. Yeah, well, that's Binance. And, okay. and some of the others, but uh, the leveraged, the leveraged casinos, gotcha. Yeah, which is, yeah. yeah, they may, they may have. I think they do also have alts there, but for the most part, people are trading leveraged Bitcoin on uh, on FTX and Bitmax. Gotcha. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Optimus. You have any questions? Uh, yeah. Um, for someone that just happened to come across this recording and hasn't heard Swan. Um, I'm pretty familiar with it, but what are your fees regarding Swan versus other the exchanges right now? Yeah, so uh, we are 60 to 80% less than Coinbase for automatic recurring purchase. Uh, most of our clients are in our lowest fee tier, which is basically anyone doing 50 bucks or more a week. Uh, if you prepay your fees annually, you'll, you're at 0.99% um, versus Coinbase at 50 bucks a week is 3.98%. Um, so that's 75% savings there. Uh, if you do pay as you go, it's 1.19%, uh, so slightly, slightly more, but that's still 70% lower than Coinbase. Um, and then like, you know, our, our smallest purchasers, you know, people that are just nibbling, you know, high school seniors or whatever, 18 plus. Um, you know, you could, you could go, uh, 10 bucks a week, let's say, and our most expensive plan is, uh, is 1.99%, uh, for prepaid annually 2.29% pay as you go, which is, you know, 77 to 80% less than Coinbase. Coinbase, if you're just nibbling at it and you're just getting started with Bitcoin, you don't have much money and you're doing 10 bucks a week, Coinbase and Gemini charge you 9.9%. Holy shit. I didn't even realize yeah. It's not, yeah, right. not very nice. They really don't want those customers at all. 
they, they literally just don't want them. So they just make it too expensive to serve them. Um, and you kind of see that like people that have more of a high touch brokerage model, they just can't serve people for small buys. Yeah. I mean, uh, sorry, Optimus, like my experience with, with Gemini, like, cause that's usually the exchange that I use if I want to make a big purchase is man, they're sneaky about it. If you don't activate active trader on Gemini, they kill you with the fees. And it's not like a very obvious option either. You know, you have to contact support, you have to let them know, and then you could activate it. That's kind of their version of like Coinbase Pro, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So Optimus, what were you saying? Oh, no, I, I was just, I, I wasn't even aware. I've been off Coinbase for a while and those fees are extremely high. I, yeah, uh, yeah that, that's one of the reasons why I love Swan so much. The fees are so good. And that, that's one of the reasons why I'm a user. Yeah. Yeah. And like, you know, similarly versus, uh, you know, cash app, that $50 or a hundred dollar a week purchase cash app is 2.33%. So we're 57% lower for prepaid fees and 48% lower. If you do pay, uh, pay as you go. Awesome. Uh, Nick, do you have any questions? Uh, you might have already answered this in a way, but when you stack on Swan, do you market by like that price or do you pay at like a couple hundred higher or how is that? Yeah, no, it's just, it's just a market buy. Um, we buy once a day, uh, typically somewhere around like 5 p.m. Pacific. So hopefully when we get big one day, there'll be just like a, a swan pump every day. No. Um, I think by then we'll be spreading it out and we'll actually be buying multiple times a day by the time we actually meaningful of, meaningfully affect um, volumes. But yeah, right now it's just once a day. Um, and so you might catch a break and, you know, the purchase is early in the day and it pumps later and people are tweeting about that. And it, we seem to have had like a lucky streak lately with, with where our daily buys have come in. But I just keep on reminding people like that might go against you someday. But, it, you know, in the end, you know, you're just you're just buying regularly and your price is going to be about the average price. And the nice thing is you can go back and you can see the exact price paid in the timestamp and you can check it versus an exchange, and, you know, don't trust verify. And we are doing market buys, um, you know, at sort of the broad, the broad price that you're going to see from the big exchanges and the OTC desks. That's good. Cause like today, um, blue wallet came out with that update where you could buy non KYC Bitcoin. And I was looking around at it. because I was thinking, Oh, this is like really cool. I want some non KYC Bitcoin. But then when I went to hit buy, I noticed the price I was buying at was like $10,060 when the actual market price was like 9,600. And I was like, nah, fuck that. Yeah, it's pretty typical. I think there's another service that caught some flack last week for having price like a thousand dollars over, <laughs> over the market price. Um, yeah, people will hide fees. Um, you know, there, there are services out there that, uh, take a spread. Um, we're not one of them. Awesome. That's awesome. Good to hear. Yeah. Courtney Chris, do you have a question, bro? Yeah, I got a question for you about, um, what do you think about the, uh, the Coinbase PayPal thing? Is it FUD or is it FUD? <laughs> Uh, is it real? <laughs> what's the Coinbase PayPal thing? Oh, um, so uh, what is it? Uh, like, there's like, there's a bunch of stuff going around on Twitter that uh, you know PayPal is going to be starting to offer, uh, you know, Bitcoin purchasing and whatnot, and somehow Coinbase is going to be involved in this. Mm. I I don't I, I know I know nothing beyond that, but okay. I, I think I think it's BS. Yeah, I mean, we we covered that. Uh, I mean, they're going to have to get their Bitcoin from somewhere and they're probably going to use a custodian as well. So you would imagine that all of the people who offer custody are vying for that business. That includes Coinbase, which bought Zappos institutional custody business. So it'd be natural for them to try to hunt that. Obviously, Gemini tries to custody as many people as they can. They custody you BlockFi and will probably try to compete for that. Anchorage will compete for that. Um, you know, Prime Trust is a custodian that custodies us and... Binance will be OKX and a bunch of crypto funds and other businesses. So, you know, somebody's going to provide the Bitcoin for Venmo PayPal and somebody's going to custody it for them. They're not going to do it themselves probably. So, 
yeah, that probably is truth to the rumor that there are conversations there. Do you think that there, but do you think that PayPal is actually going to get into this game? That That's the other thing, right? Supposedly oh, yeah, I do. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we just talked about that with Nico a little bit, but yes, I do think they're getting in. Okay. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. I, they, they suck as a service. Don't get me wrong. Like they're, they can barely do fiat. So I'm not really worried about them in Bitcoin. So I, I think it's going to be funny to see them start to learn. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, remember their company's goal originally when it was like Peter Thiel and Elon and Ken Howery and all these guys, Max Levchin and David Sachs, like their goal was to create a new global currency on the internet. They just couldn't figure out how to do it. And they ended up, you know, sending money by email sort of. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it, it is kind of funny to see like, um, you know, David Marcus out there uh, leading Libra, Libra or whatever, and testifying for Congress and whatever, like, you know, the dude was a huge early Bitcoiner and loves Bitcoin and mm -hmm. wanted to do, wanted to do Libra on Bitcoin and couldn't win the battle just because of like volatility and not large enough market cap and didn't think they could get it through regulatory. Um, and obviously, you know, they wanted to do payment rails and all kinds of things that would just like not be possible, uh, not let them make the money that they probably want to make, which is uh, a common thing with people trying to use Bitcoin for payment rails. <laughs> I, I actually think, I mean, I, I, I think that uh, Bitcoin's volatility is, uh, you know, it's a feature. Oh, I do too. <laughs> right? well, especially, especially on the way up because it sucks in, <laughs> sucks in greedy bastards like me. And then you realize it's not about money. It's about the money. <laughs> and all the good things that come with it. And it just like pulls us in as disciples for the cause and turns us into missionaries. So yes, it is the, the flame that draws people in. You know, I, I was exposed to Bitcoin in early 14 and late 15 and nothing happened. It didn't take. It wasn't until the price run up in spring of 17 that I got drawn in. So yeah, I'm, I'm very interested to see like how many of my friends from all different walks of life and different stages my personal and professional life get pulled in by this next cycle and become fun new Bitcoin friends for all of us. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Um, man, that, man, I love talking to Bitcoiners, but listen, so um, on Swan, you have this awesome feature. It's extremely unique. Um, and it's the really dope referral link that you guys do. Right. And I, I saw a screenshot of American hold the other day where he basically had his own Bitcoin quote. So I was wondering, first of all, you got to talk to us about that referral link idea. Cause man, that's so unique. It's so clever. And what is your own personal Bitcoin quote? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, listen, affiliate programs have been out there forever, but yeah, but wait, 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 wait. Okay, that doesn't do it justice. Corey. It does. Hold well, on. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get, <laughs> I'm gonna get there, bro. I'm gonna get there. Listen, here, here's the thing. I, I think that people share things more when it makes them feel cool or makes them feel special. Um, so one of the things that we're doing, you know, I, I'm gonna actually tease something else that's not live yet, which is kind of gives you a window into how we think. So we're launching something called Arsenal, which is something I thought of and been working on for a long time. And Brecky Von Bitcoin has been leading for us. And we basically aggregated, you know, 30 or 40 of the top Bitcoin artists and meme warriors and meme creators that are all sort of contributing to this thing. And essentially what it is, is it's a, it is an arsenal. It's an armory of Bitcoin memes and quotes and slide decks and all kinds of things that let you go out and then win the money meme wars of the 2020s that we have just begun and go out there and dominate gold and fiat uh, for the cause of Bitcoin. Like this is, this is the army, right, that we're building. And, you know, we think that people, when you make it easy for somebody to grab a meme, make a meme, grab a quote, use a quote, contrast it with another quote, you know, and sort of just provide those building blocks or the ready-made things, then they'll go to war and they, they will use those weapons well. Um, and, and they like it because it makes them feel, uh, cool and like they've done their part and like they, they've done it well rather than just, you know, trying to come up with something off the cuff. Um, similarly with our affiliate program, like we just want people to feel proud of something that they're sharing. So if you put in your URL on Twitter or Telegram or whatever, and the preview image 
looks super dope and it's like the picture that you chose and you know it says you know max welcomes you to swan or nico welcomes you to swan or whatever um that's pretty cool um so that's that's what we do and you know the uh the unique custom urls when you click on one of them it goes to the swan website but it has a welcome bar that has the picture of the person who uh whose url you're you're using and uh, and a quote from them um, mine is not too many years from now, the number of Bitcoiners in the United States of America will cross 10 million. When we hit that milestone, it's game over. Bitcoin wins. <laughs> love it. Love it. Let's go. Uh, yeah. And, you know, so we've got like, you know, so if you go to like Preston, which is Preston Pish, he'll have, you know, Bitcoin is a time fuse. It's a Trojan horse. This is achieved by the protocol's coordination between the four year having and two week difficulty adjustment working in harmony. This produces entrenchment into the existing financial system and its guise is volatility. So that's, uh, I think he stole that from you, Coin Icarus. <laughs> what a joke. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, that's right. pretty epic. That's pretty yeah. Epic. yeah, so that's, yeah, and then I think I'm pretty sure Hoddles just says ER plus BTB, but I'm not sure. His, his new his, his, his new one is the uh, 71 equals 21, I think, or 21 equals 71. I think it's 71 equals 21. Interesting. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> uh, his, his says, uh, so if you go to swanbitcoin.com slash hodl, it's uh, the fiat dollar is nothing more than a story we agree to tell ourselves over and over again until we forget that it's a lie. I stopped telling that lie a while ago. Pretty deep, man. I think you guys hit the nail on the head with that tactic, huh? It's awesome. Yeah, it's going well. I mean, it's really, I, I think uh, it really started going nuts when uh, Max Kaiser decided to go hard and like give over his Twitter and his daily national cable show essentially to shilling Swan. So he's like wearing a Swan, <laughs> a Swan lapel pen and talking about Swan and Bitcoin every single day now. And it's, yeah, that's uh, awesome. so that's been really good since he got involved. Freaking awesome. huge. That's awesome. All right. So this is my last question before I move on to the rest of the group, but it's basically, I want to get into, actually, it's my second to last question. Right? The last question I always ask at the end of the show, but it's not very complicated. But my second to last question is, uh, Corey, we're going to get, I'm going to get into like speculation territory, mm -hmm. uh, ultra bull, you know, this is just talking about, you know, moonshots, whatever. What do you think Bitcoin's going to be at at the end of 2021? I know this is a crazy question. No one knows the answer. I just want to get your thoughts. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to change my forecast. I've been saying between 150 and 300 for a long, long time. I still think that's probably ballpark valid. Super I bullish. I don't, is it? I don't, I, I don't know, man. That sounds amazing to me. <laughs> I, I feel like Tina would be here like slapping me in the face saying, you're not thinking big enough. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. All right. So, uh, man, thank you for that. Uh, Optimus, your last question, bro. Um, yeah. Um, so you mentioned the money wars that we're uh, going into. And as someone that's close to, you know, Bitcoin and the legacy financial system, do you think that it's an even possibility for Bitcoiners to get executive ordered 6102? No, I don't think you can pull that off. Um, now, do I think that there might, like, is there a chance that somebody tries to pull it off and you have to mobilize and fight against it? Yeah, I think there is a chance. And there's a chance that we have to, uh, you know, fight legislation sometime in the next five years. And it's, you know, it's the reason that I wrote that piece, 10 million Bitcoiners, and it's really the reason that I chose to fight this fight in this way, um, which is, you know, it's probably easier to make a lot of money just going after super rich people and trying to get them to buy lots of Bitcoin. But I think it helps Bitcoin a lot more to get uh, way more Bitcoiners to own some. That's just kind of, I, I just wanted to get as many people involved as possible. Um, and selfishly, like I know that Bitcoin is anti-fragile and there's no way to shut it down. And so a 6102 type order in the US would only affect Bitcoiners in the US, but damn it, I live here and I have two daughters and I don't want to move. And I want to be able to enjoy the, the fruits of my, my labor and my good choices getting involved in Bitcoin, you know, late but earlier than lots of people um 
you know, in this lifetime and, you know, in the coming decades, I don't want it to, you know, have to shut down in the U S and then grow only in black markets and in other countries. Um, I want it to just have a, a, a nice smooth rise and kind of like a, just take over uh, without disrupting my life and lots of other people's lives. So, you know, that is, that is selfish, but that is the incentive that Bitcoin has created. Like I, I do very much want to, uh, you know, see it, see it rise unimpeded in the U S and I think getting vocal proponents of it that live in every single district and will make it difficult for Brad Sherman and any of his stupid friends <laughs> to do anything against Bitcoin because we will be the vocal minority, the intransigent minority, the three to three and a half percent of people that are required to flip a system. Um, I think we can achieve that pretty quickly, ideally in this cycle. And so if they don't, if they don't get their shit together to clamp down on Bitcoin super hard in the next few years, then it's never going to happen. So that's why I think it's really important to focus like right now on spreading Bitcoin as far and wide as possible. Beautiful. Love that answer. Awesome. Uh, Nick, your last question, bro. Um, you probably saw, it was either the other day or other week, Coinbase was caught selling their users' data to the government. What do you think about that? And would you at Swan ever do that? Uh, so uh, the second part, no, we would never do that. Uh, we also try to uh, keep as little data as possible. One of the nice things about not being a uh, custodian and not having uh, the requirements of someone who has uh, money transmitter licenses in the federal MSB. So if you're a brokerage, um, like a river, or like one of the exchanges, you have data requirements, and you have to have a chief compliance officer, and you actually have to keep all this customer data. We don't beyond kind of the minimal of what's required to continue to maintain an account. We collect the data that's required for, uh, you know, for prime trust as a custodian, you know, they obviously have compliance, but we can destroy it from our servers and we do. Um, so we collect it and then destroy it. Um, you know, so what, what's nice about that is, you know, a team of four full-time employees and a bunch of part-time people doesn't have to have, uh, like we don't have a honeypot. There's no, there's no data to come get and there's no money to come get. Like hacking Swan is just stupid. There's nothing, there's nothing there. <laughs> it's, just a, it's just a communication interface essentially. Um, so we do have that benefit of, you know, not only, not only do we not have data to sell to anybody, there's also no data of value to hack from us. Good. Man, um, as a Swan user, that makes me, that makes me feel real good. I'm sorry to cut you off, Nick. Yeah. No, you're good. I was just going to say it pissed me off when I saw Coinbase was doing that shit and I wasn't really surprised either. I think what we've seen time and time again is like these are not mistakes um, and these aren't even considered because it, it just it's it flows down from the top and it's uh, you know the least cypherpunk dude of all time happened to start a well-designed Bitcoin exchange eight years ago and has a first mover advantage, which has been fueled by lots of easy money flowing in through VC channels um, to essentially anoint and maintain the winner. And, you know, they've, they've created an incredible opportunity because, you know, the guy's an introvert and has bad taste in people. So he surrounded himself with people that make bad choices and, you know, they don't do much media because they can't because he'll say the wrong things if he does podcasts. <laughs> and, you know it's just it's not a it, it's not a great spot to be in they should just sell themselves to jp morgan as soon as possible which is really what they want to do i'm sure just don't reply to any fake account of a uh, jk rolling trying to sell them bitcoin <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you know, it's, I try to, I try to have empathy for people as much as I can, but like, it's, uh, at some point you have to, you have to not care whether they did it because they were evil or because they were stupid. The result is the same. And you, you really have to judge people based on the decisions that they actually make, regardless of whether they made it because they're evil or stupid. 
So I stopped caring whether Coinbase does stupid things or evil things. They're just doing dumb things that are bad. <laughs> Before I we blame, pass it off to Coinbase. I blame Balaji for most of it, by the way. Most of the work. <laughs> most of the, I mean, the, probably like th three or four of the worst 10 products to come out of Silicon Valley in the last 10 years have all been the same guy. <laughs> <laughs> He's uh, yeah, I, yeah. Before we pass it to Coin Acres, I was just wondering. I I see the Swan logo back there. Are we gonna get some Swan swag soon, so we can all be the marketing force? It might be already out. I'm not sure. Yeah. So, I, it's a very Swan thing to do. So we uh, we are putting out a lot of merch. Uh, I wish I had my Swan Force mug here. I usually drink from it all day. That's awesome. Um, and uh, it is not a profit center for us. So we actually are not making money on our merch. We're just putting. Uh, a good bit of effort into lots of sick designs and putting it up on like Zazzle and Cafe Press and letting anybody order whatever they want with no margin taken. Let's go. All right. Well, might have to get me a swan shirt. In fact, let me see here. We haven't publicized it yet, but I think if you go to Zazzle, let's see if Zazzle Swan Bitcoin is already up. I know the Cafe Press site is up. Uh, hang on. Sorry for the, the silence here. I just want to see what, uh, what Brecky has already loaded in here, if anything. It's all good. I'll, I'll edit in a face of Brian Armstrong with, with horns. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so the Cafe Press site is up, but not the, uh, not the Zazzle one yet. But I think we're going to end up doing Zazzle, but we'll, we'll announce it and make a big splash about it and you know, throw pictures up. Uh, there is somebody getting a swan tattoo. I've tried to dissuade them um, <laughs> and told them you might want to rethink that. But uh, I think they actually have gone. They've, they've scheduled the tattoo. It's happening like uh, this weekend, I think, this coming wow. weekend. So that'll be interesting. That's great. Uh, what else? I think Phil, Mr. Sue, did a swan tan too, which I did not. <laughs> suggest <laughs> or endorse in any way but there's pictures of it on the internet so that happened <laughs> nice i don't know man i think uh i think it's fun i really do i really like i i think i think bitcoin is the thing that people can get behind more than just about anything else um right now and i think uh you know cool bitcoin merch especially bitcoin merch that bitcoiners may know is Bitcoin related, but that maintains your OPSEC yep. uh, is really crucial. So we've actually uh, collected a bunch of different URLs that don't have Bitcoin in it, but that redirect to us <laughs> so that That's people dope. can use those on different I merge items and things like that. So we're just trying to make it a little bit more fun. Um, you know, I've, I've loved the uh, toxic maximalist hats and I love all the guns and Bitcoin hats and shirts and stuff like that, even though Ragnar and I don't always get along. Uh, I, I still just I love anything that companies put out in the space. The bull Bitcoin gear over the years has always just been so sick. Um, we're also going to feature a lot of um, um, art and merch from other companies in our store on our site, so that'll be fun too. So, cool. We're looking out for that. Thanks, bro. Awesome, awesome. All right. So, I think anyone else have any last questions before I wrap it up? No, I'm good. Oh, no, thank no. you. Okay. All right. Uh, guys, thank can you I, so can much. Can I just say one thing? Yeah, of course, I just, man. I, I just, Nick, I wanted to thank you for, uh, for giving me my job back when you decided <laughs> to go work for uh, Bitcoin Magazine. It, was, it really was a pleasure and an honor uh, to learn from you for those six short weeks when you were uh, running Swan. So, uh, so thank you again. We all appreciate you and, and wish you well in your new endeavors. Thank you. I hope the sales didn't drop too much when I announced <laughs> Yeah, we, we took a little bit of a hit, but we shook it off. It's <laughs> hilarious. All right. Um, guys, thanks so much for tuning in. If you like what you see, don't forget to like and subscribe to Fun with Bitcoin, BTC Kindergarten, and the Crypto Creamers. And man, I usually end the podcast with one last question. It's kind of stupid, but it's in the name. Uh, what is Swan Bitcoin's favorite ice cream flavor? Oh, that's a good question. That is a really good question. Um, so listen, I'm going to, I'm going to answer for uh, the little signet downstairs, my two year old who is uh, 
sadly allergic to uh, milk. So she is really digging this like uh, coconut ice cream that's like uh, a hazelnut fudge. So we're gonna go uh, coconut hazelnut fudge is uh, the Swan House's favorite ice cream right now. Very, very interesting. Um, and, and yeah, man, thanks for answering that. I'm going to take a spread, like a Google spreadsheet. I've interviewed some really interesting people. I'm just putting their favorite ice cream flavors. You know, you never know what that's going to be worth in 10 years. I don't know. Anyways, guys, thanks again for tuning in. And again, don't forget to like and subscribe. Bye. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed that collab. All the details for the uh, contacts will be in the show notes. And again, that was Crypto Creamers, BTC Kindergarten, and myself, Fun with Bitcoin. So if you guys want to reach me on Telegram or Twitter, I am at Coin Icarus. If you want to shoot me an email, Coin Icarus at funwithbitcoin.com. Thank you all for listening and catch you all next time.